we are for the last keynote, the final keynote of this event. And I'm really happy uh, she accepted to be here with us today from Australia. So for her, it's about 7.30 in the morning. Let's appreciate this fact. And, um, and so uh, Dr. Uh, Maria host Rubli will present um, uh, part of a big study she was part of, uh, and she will present speci especially for us today on the diversity of the Canadian uh, security studies. So Maria, are you with us? Yes, I am, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I really wish I could have been with you in person. Um, unfortunately, you know, my university is super conservative about international travel these days still. And I, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you earlier. As you know, it's it's quite early. Um, but I've looked through the, the papers and the program, and I just really want to congratulate you on putting together it looks like an amazing um, set of discussions about uh, you know, the way that we understand the military and how we understand it and lived experiences. And so I really look forward to conversations and work that comes out of this program. And I'm honored to be, um, you know, invited to be able to discuss with you some of the research that I've done with colleagues um, related to the state of diversity in Canadian security studies. Because really, if we want to talk about new ways of thinking about researching the military, um, is the environment for researching the military a welcome place? And is it inclusive or does it exclude certain people? And if it excludes people and is hostile to people, then that is necessarily going to end up limiting um, the ways that we research it uh, because we're, we're already from the start shutting down different perspectives. So I'll, I'll start my slides in just a second. But before I begin, I wanted to um, have acknowledgement of country. Um, here in Australia, we we like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, we're meeting from. And I'm meeting from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I wanna pay my respects to um, elders past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. Okay, so this is part of a, a larger project. Um, and you can see the project team here, You know, some amazing people in Canada and my colleague, Connie Duncombe um, from Monash, now Copenhagen. So if you go to the next slide, and um, next slide, thanks. So basically we'll just talk about the background of the project, sort of our methods, and then the most interesting stuff, the findings, and then hopefully you all have some questions and some feedback for, for us. Next slide. So this actually began as a mines grant project um, as you all know, the Canadian Armed Forces has a lot of trouble recruiting and retaining women and minorities. Um, and so we were looking at to what extent and what ways does the lack of diversity in Canadian security studies affect the armed forces and the larger national securities workforces ability to, to recruit and retain a diverse workforce. So that's the larger project. Next slide. And so um, our questions were, first of all, what is the state of diversity in security studies? We've done research on global security studies and, and the state of diversity is not great, but you know it could be different in Canada, we thought. So first we need to investigate that. And then we um, looked at the links between diversity in Canadian security studies and um, the ability of the national security workforce to recruit and retain diverse individuals. So in this presentation, we're, I'm focusing on question one. Although we're, you know, happy to talk about question two as well. Next slide. And so the first thing is, is what do we mean by diversity? And so um, we, you know, the focus is on demographic characteristics, but we also included um, intellectual orientation. For example, positivists versus post-positivists, um, academics, etc. And for this um, for this project, which is really a pilot because it, it was quite small, we wanted to look at in particular gender, race, and geography. But we found that um, studying um, gender and geography are easier. And that is because, for example, you'll see we looked at Canadian journals, we looked at authors, you know, um, and, and so it's easier, for example, to say, well, wh wh 
what's the location of this author's institution? Like you can look that up. And in terms of gender, um, you know, there are tools online that will, you know, look at syllabi and look at journal um, author lists and, you know, they do a gender count and they, they can be incorrect. And of course, you know, having a gender binary is, um, you know, is also not reflective, but in general, it's, you know, three to 4% error rate. So, you know, that for a pilot, we can work with that, but we found with race, obviously, um, classifying people's race based on names or appearances is inappropriate and, in my opinion, unethical. Um, so we we thought we would use the survey um, to approach race, but we had only a small number of scholars of color, which made it difficult to draw conclusions from the survey result. So one of our conclusions is, is that we, you know, just because I'm talking today about gender, um, that does not mean we don't think race is important. We actually think it's incredibly important. And we are, you know, arguing to minds that, you know, a separate study needs to be done using appropriate methodological tools so that we can capture this really critical component of diversity in Canadian security studies. Um, we're also sensitive to other dimensions of diversity, including indigeneity, age, religion, sexual orientation, linguistic diversity, disability. Next slide. So we did a um, survey of researchers in Canadian security studies, and then we did a bunch of data collection on security related journals and security study syllabi at major universities. We also had two workshops where um, academics and graduate students, you know, talk to us about their experiences. And then in the survey, we also had a lot of open text field responses that gave us good qualitative com um, commentary. The next slide. So the big question is, of course, with surveys is how representative are they? And, um, you know, I can talk about this at more length if you'd like, but we did have, um, you know, in terms of our, the, the percentage of people who responded, we could say that the survey is, was a representative um, proportion in terms of the, the responses. However, they were almost all lectures um, and instructors. We are missing graduate students. Also, we did call this a diversity survey, and this may have influenced who responded it. Just to just to be honest, because you know some people will be more interested in that, and some people will be less interested in that. And as I mentioned, we only had a small number of scholars of color, so. Um, as a result, the initial analysis focuses on gender. Next slide. So here's just sort of some um, general findings of our, from the survey. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to Canadian security studies, um, from our survey, you know, our, is Canadian security studies mostly positivist, mostly critical? Um, and so you can see here, we had about, you know, 40, a little over 40% positivist, and then 30% um, non-positivist, and 25% saying they were post-positivist. So I thought this was interesting. It was, um, you know, when we look at our U.S. data, this is definitely less positivist than the U.S., but I guess that makes sense. The U.S. is probably, I think, one of the most positivist um, in terms of its orientation in, in security studies. Next slide. So in terms of what methods people use, um, and so you can see um, people could choose up to three. And so case studies and qualitative were right at the top. So we've got a lot of qualitative researchers, um, policy analysis, um, you can see quantitative at 16% and, and on from there. Next slide. What theories do people use? Um, I found this super interesting, constructivism um, being, you know, almost 30%. And actually in our global survey, um, constructivism was the number one as well, which, you know, typically when you think about security studies, you think it's dominated by realism, but when it comes, and that may actually be the case when it comes to, you know, for example, the big blogs that are out there and, you know, the research that tends to be highlighted, but in terms of the, the theoretical approach that, uh, researchers are using constructivism is, um, you know, is a, a larger percentage. It's really interesting, other is 17%. I mean, that's quite high, 
Um, and a lot of the others were, I don't, you've asked me to pick one, I don't use just one. I use a, I use a, you know, a blend or I use the theory that makes the most sense for the topic I'm using, et cetera. Next slide. And then, um, so when, when we talk about Canadian security studies, are we talking about security studies for Canada or are we talking about people in Canada who do international security? And so you can see here, um, people could check all that apply. And so we have a mix of people doing international security broadly, Canada, Canada and comparative contacts, and then people who do specifically um, Canadian security issues. Next slide. This is a huge chart, and I actually was going to cut off some of the bottom ones, but I thought it was just interesting to see what topics people say they're looking at. And so um, you can just see there's you can check people could check all that apply here. So, so um, you've got theories, um, armed forces, great power competition, human rights, civil conflict, terrorism. Um, it's interesting. Other is again, it was about seventeen percent, and in that other category, we had it was a very large range of responses. You know, migration and refugees to. Oh, I'm forgetting oh, peacekeeping. There were a lot of peacekeeping, peace building, and just sort of a very broad range of other topics that fit under, um, you know, that other category. Next slide. Now, um, we, I want to talk to you quickly about gender and Canadian security studies and the results from the survey um, related to that. Next slide. So the first thing we, we looked at was atmosphere. You know, what's the atmosphere of Canadian security studies? And we have this question, do you feel welcome in Canadian security studies? <clears throat> and you can see here, there's a statistically significant difference between men and women. If you look at the never category, no, um, no male identifying respondents said they never feel welcome, whereas a full 10% of women did. And, you know, almost 40% of men said they always feel welcome. In fact, more women said they never feel welcome than always feel welcome. So obviously men and women are experiencing Canadian security studies in significantly different ways here. Next slide. We asked, to what extent is security studies insular? Is it clubby? Is it an old boys network? Or is it diverse and inclusive? And again, we saw significant differences between um, men and women in terms of the respondents. Next slide. Um, another question we asked was about harassment, experience of harassment. Obviously, you know, that has a lot to do with, you know, if, if we're thinking about, you know, do people feel welcome, experiences of um, verbal, nonverbal behaviors that convey hostility, objectification, exclusion, or second-class status are, you know, important to, to that culture. And you can see here um, statistically significant differences. Women were two and a half times more likely to answer yes than men. Um, and by the way, just generally, uh, we've done this survey um, with global security studies, and all of these findings are similar. So what we're seeing in Canada is not different than what we saw in, in global security studies, unfortunately. Um, next slide. And so the question is, well, why, you know, if somebody's harassed um, just because someone's a woman, they may not necessarily think it's because of their gender. Um, and so we asked, um, do you believe that the hostility, objectification, exclusion, or second-class status you experienced was due to these factors? And people could check all that apply. And so you can see here, um, you know, women, um, so 86% of the women that, that said they had experienced this attributed it to their gender um, compared to only 9% of men. And it's interesting, um, the, the next ranked top um, category for women was their preferred theoretical approach. Um, and for men, that was definitely the top category. Okay, next slide. And so we also asked, asked about professional development. What type of professional development our, our um, scholars interested in? And so here's a question looking, asking, um, do you think initiatives that promote diversity and inclusiveness, do you think these are needed? And so you can see the gray 
um, that is no. And so, you know, um, our male respondents were almost three times as likely to say, no, they're not needed than our, than our women respondents. Um, so again, these are all statistically significant findings. Next slide. And would you be interested in participating in these initiatives? And again, you can see very stark differences. Um, you know, women were more than more than twice as likely to say yes, they would like to, yes, to a great extent, I'd want to participate in these. Next slide. Now we'll turn to journals um, and and who dominates the pages of Canadian security studies journals. And uh, you know, it's not a surprise. <laughs> uh, the answer is men. Um, but we'll go ahead and look at the, the data. Next slide. So first of all, I just want to say we've looked at global security related journals, and you can see at the bottom, we have these uh, different journals that we've looked at. And, um, you know, in terms of journal authorship, we found that women represent about 35% of academics within security studies. And we found that actually um, percentage was similar in Canada. And so we're not expecting women to be 50% of the authors. We would expect them if things were, you know, if there was equity, they'd be about 35% because that's their percentage of the population. But um, the representation in key global security studies journals falls below that 35% mark almost, you know, in almost all the journals. Next slide. And so in Canada, it's also the case. So we looked at three Canadian security related journals. Um, International Journal, um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal, and the Canadian Military Journal. And you can see here male authors versus female authors all below 35%. And obviously some, you know, within the journals, you know, some do better than others. Next slide. Now, in terms of, um, you know, first author position, second author position, within the three journals, um, male authors, again, dominate. In fact, you can see, um, so all of these add up to 100. And um, so male authors in second or later positions um, actually outnumber female authors in first position. So there's um, second authors or later, so second, third, fourth authors, 18% um, of, of all the authors um, who fall into that category are, are men, whereas um, women authors, uh, first authors are only 17.8%. So almost about equal, but still, it just goes to show that you know, women are um, you know, not well represented in the journals here. Next slide. Um, we um, don't present much in terms of this uh, in terms of this presentation, in terms of geography, but we did want to, you know, this is something I think is important to say that um, in terms of geography, 78% of the authors are from um, Canada, which makes sense. Um, another 16% are from the global north, excluding Canada, and only 6% from the global south. And um, of those global south authors, all but three write on their country or region. So they're writing because, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, we might have an author, um, you know, an, an author from Egypt who's writing about, um, you know, Middle Eastern security issues. And, um, and then within Canadian Military Journal, there was only one Global South author in, in all the years that we looked at. Next slide. And then syllabi analysis. Um, we just sort of a quick overview of what we saw in syllabi from major um, security studies classes at uh, at some of the Canadian universities. Next slide. Now, look, I just want to say this is a convenient sample. You know, in terms of the journals, like we collected every single research article, and so we can say that. Um, by the way, the the journal differences were all statistically significant as well as, as you can imagine. But this was a convenient sample. We looked at the publicly available security related syllabi. And so it, we can't be as sure in terms of our conclusions, what we come up with. Um, but I, I will say in advance that 
there is a lot of research done on gender representation in, in international relations syllabi and political science syllabi, and our findings um, are closely uh, closely mimic that. So even though this is a convenient sample and we can't really make claims about generalizability, they do fit up you know, quite closely our findings with, with larger studies. Uh, next slide. And so as you can guess here, um, uh, male authors dominate the syllabi, um, almost 75%, 25% um, female authors, and 2% organizational authors like World Bank, et cetera. Next slide. And then this, this we thought was really interesting. And again, this is a statistically significant difference. Um, in terms of who assigns male authors and who assigns female authors, um, so uh, classes led by women were much more likely to assign um, women authors than um, classes led by men. And this is, again, a finding that is mimicked or, you know, that we can see in, in uh, studies of, you know, larger syllabi collections, not just a small convenient sample like we have. Um, and so, you know, this also has a role when, when students are, you know, studying security studies and they, you know, see, well, who, who am I reading? Like, who, who's, who belongs in security studies? You know, syllabi, we think, have an important role in socializing students about who fits into the national security national security workforce in the military. And so it's a little disheartening to see, like with the journals that um, women authors are, are underrepresented, you know, below that 35% line. Next slide. So our overall findings um, are that Canadian security studies, um, it does not reflect the diversity of scholars and the students studying it, and it doesn't reflect the diversity of the Canadian population. Um, and so what's needed next? And so um, we're arguing that we need more focused research using targeted appropriate methods on other critical aspects of diversity. Um, if you're familiar with the diversity, equity, and inclusion scholarship, there tends to be a big focus on gender and less focus on other aspects of diversity. And we're aware of that and, and unhappy about that. And, um, you know, in our own study, we found out, you know, what, you know, it was, difficult for us to understand, for example, race. And so this should not be just sort of a footnote. This is really very important. And so, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're talking to minds about this and I'm talking to other scholars, for example, you know, a project on race and ethnicity, I wouldn't be the appropriate person to lead that, I don't think, because I think lived experience is really an important component. But we're talking with scholars in Canada um, with lived experience and that who you know, who might be interested in, in leading a project like that. In other words, it's really important. And we, we think it is. And we're telling this to minds. And we're telling them that you've got to fund this stuff. And we're working with people, um, you know, who, who might be interested to continue this research. Um, we also think it's really important to explore links between representation, um, knowledge production, and national security policy. Because as you know, and I'm, you've been talking about in your in the program all day, that there are links here that who studies the military um, and what we study about the military has impacts on what we know about the military and therefore on military policy. And so these links are important and we have some ideas about them that I can talk about. Um, but right now we just have hypotheses. And so testing those links, thinking about them, um, interrogating them is really the next critical part of this research agenda as well. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions that you have. For well, this uh, wonderful presentation, and uh, is there any question for? Yes. Uh, sorry for the delay um, in the question. I, I was sorry. My name's uh, Michael Murphy. I'm a postdoc here at Queens. Um, I've 
previously worked on this kind of topic of what are the trends in in the professoriate in, in Canadian IR. So I found this to be a just a fascinating presentation. And the theoretical pattern in the journals really jumped out at me in terms of gender representation, um, because there are two journals that are clearly head and shoulders above the others. Uh, and they both happen to be the two top journals in critical security studies. Uh, I thought that that was um, fascinating because within Canadian IR uh, departments, there are established pockets where those critical uh, IR scholars teach and research and where it's you know more the conventional three paradigm departments. Um, I was wondering, because you have that syllabus data, did you notice any differences between the institutions that are teaching and researching more of that critical security studies versus more conventional? That's that's a great question. And um, it's interesting. I, I did want to say um, the, the when we were looking at the global research, one of the questions that came up was um, we found in our, let me back up, in our global survey, we found that both women and scholars of color are less likely to feel welcome. And so one of the questions reviewers asked um, was, well, is this because these you know, women scholars or scholars of color use, for example, critical approaches? And we found that that did not make a difference, that you know, when you accounted for that, that women scholars and scholars of color still felt less welcome accounting for differences in theoretical approach or epistemology, et cetera. Um, which I think is important to know, but you're right that those journals, um, the critical journals are much better in terms of that representation. In terms of the syllabi, we didn't do that. I mean, that would be a great thing to do. To be over honest, we were a little overwhelmed with the number. We had almost 1,700 readings, and um, uh, Steve Sademan, who was part of our team, you know, and he's published some on sort of divisions within Canadian IR and you know you know some schools approach it this way other schools approach it that way and so um, you know I think that would be a great thing to go back and look at you know the different universities and their approaches and to what extent that has an effect on the gender composition I can tell you that some of the classes for example we had a children and war class um, uh, just because I did some of the data entry some of the critical classes absolutely had more women. Um, were higher in percentage. So my guess is, is that yes, we would definitely see that play out um, if we did the, the, the numbers on it. But that's a great suggestion, one that I'm going to uh, mark down that we should do with, because we've got the data, so it wouldn't be that hard to pull it out. Thank you. There's another question from Marshall. Okay, hey, thank you. I have a question about the Canadian Military Journal. So it was about 17% uh, women authors, and that, that's roughly or a little bit higher than the percentage in the, of women in the Canadian Armed Forces. I was wondering, when you looked at that, did you look to see if the female officers were members of the forces or just gender in general without perhaps uh, that level of depth? Because I'd be really curious to know if the Military Journal is doing a representative uh, uh, approach to male and female authorship, or it just got lucky in terms of the percentage? That is super interesting. I did not know that. So thank you. That is um, something I think it's important to note, actually. Um, I don't know. I, so I, I did some of the data entry for this, but not all of it. And it was, um, the journal is mostly academic. So it's it's not typically uh, you know, it's not made up of people actually in the um, in the armed forces, although some of there could be overlap, obviously, you know, people teaching at military colleges, et cetera. But that's a great question. So we can I can go back and look at that and and see to what extent that might be. But I think it is helpful to know that, you know, the 17 percent, while low, is at least representative of of women in the Canadian armed forces. Any other question? No? So I, I think the, the, the day was very long, uh, but thank you for uh, this, uh, this keynote. And I, I, I always, already saw the, the presentation you did at the CDSN uh, 
um, presentation, but I, I thought it amazing about how to have a study about what has a, a woman researcher. We sometimes feel uh, what is like working in the, the security study and to have the number and see, oh, that's worse than I thought. But so thank you for your presentation. Um, I think we can. Thank you very much. I really appreciate um, you know being invited. And uh, if you have any questions or want further information or want the slides, et cetera, like we're completely, you know, I'd be delighted to share it with anyone who's interested. And thanks again for organizing such an amazing conference. Thank you. And um, I won't uh, stay much longer now. I just want to thank everyone. I mean, uh, every attendee in presence and virtual for being here today. And as I said, it was a long day. So thank you for being here and supporting this project. Thank you uh, for the CIDP and the CDSN and, uh, and the MINDS program to, to allow us to be here today and uh, do this conference. Thank you for the translator and thank you for the Baldwin team to do the, the tech stuff today, which was amazing. And um, and I think it's now time to say goodbye. And uh, tomorrow with the, the presenter, uh, we will work something together, do a bit of workshop, but thank you for the attendee and thank you uh, Maria again uh, for being here.